In Unit 5, we're going to build on the probability concepts we learned earlier in Unit 4 to develop tests of statistical significance. And this is a concept that we're going to be working with really for the rest of the semester. These tests help us determine whether the data provides strong evidence of a genuine effect or if the results could have occurred by chance alone. So instead of just calculating summary statistics, we're going to go further and talk about the strength of evidence that the effect is real or that it extends to the population. And to keep things simple in this unit, we'll focus just on statistical questions about one proportion. So this video is an introduction to significance tests. Um, and we're going to look at the example of a taste test between bottled water and tap water. So let's say that you're marketing a bottled water brand and you want to prove that people can tell a difference in the taste um, between your bottled water and tap water. So last semester I actually conducted a taste test comparing bottled water and tap water and I just used a sample of 10 MSIT 3000 students. Um, so each of the students that participated tasted two different cups of water and they were asked to identify which was the bottled water. So before we go further, we should probably think how widely will we be able to generalize the conclusions of this study? Can we generalize to all UGA students? Maybe. I mean, I don't necessarily think that um, MSIT 3000 students have different taste buds than students in general, so I think that seems fairly reasonable. Um, generalizing to all Americans, that's definitely not reasonable because water tastes really different in different parts of the country. Um, so it's possible that people can tell the difference in one place and they can't tell the difference somewhere else. So in this study, we're going to consider two possibilities or hypotheses. The first is that people can't tell the difference, so they're just choosing at random. This hypothesis is called the null hypothesis. And we usually symbolize that with H and a little zero next to it. Um, you can pronounce that as H naught or H O. So the null hypothesis says that people are just choosing at random. So if we think about what proportion of the time they're going to guess correctly, right, identify the bottled water and tap water correctly, it would be half the time because there's two cups of water. If you really can't tell and you're just completely guessing, you should get it right half the time. The other possibility is that bottled and tap water actually do taste different, and so people are choosing correctly more than half the time. This is called the alternative hypothesis. So the alternative hypothesis, we represent that with a capital H and a little a, and this is going to be that the real proportion, the long run proportion that people would get correct, is greater than 0.5. So in general, you can sort of think about the null hypothesis as the hypothesis that you want to rule out. You're trying to prove that people really can tell the difference, so you want to rule out the possibility that they were just guessing at random. And then you can think of the alternative hypothesis as the one that you want to prove, right? You're hoping to prove that bottled water really does taste different from tap. So when we're doing the hypothesis test, we always start off by modeling the null hypothesis. So basically it's like a what if question. What if the null hypothesis were true, what values would we expect to see? So in this case, what outcomes would we expect to see if people couldn't tell the two waters apart and they were just guessing at random? So to answer this question, we need a sampling distribution. So remember, a sampling distribution tells us the values of the statistic that we would get from different samples. So specifically, we want to think about the real taste test that I did last semester, where 7 out of 10 people identified the bottled water correctly. So notice that I'm using a new symbol here. The statistic p hat is how many identified the bottled water correctly in the sample, whereas the letter p is the population proportion, right? If I had done this taste test with all MSIT 3000 students, what proportion would I expect to identify the bottled water correctly? So our question really is if people were just choosing at random, could we get a statistic like ours? Could we get a sample proportion of 7 out of 10? So in a regular semester, I would give you a coin and ask you to flip it 10 times. And that would represent guessing randomly, trying to identify the bottled water when people really can't tell the difference. Um, but this time, since we're not together to flip coins, we'll use an applet to do this. This is an applet we've used before, and the address is tinyurl.com 
slash 3000 dash one prop for one proportion. For the probability, we're going to leave it at 0.5 because we want to know what would happen if people were really just guessing which one was the bottled and which was the tap. The number of tosses is going to be 10 because in my taste test last year, I had 10 people test the bottled water and 10 people test the tap. And if I click draw samples here, you can see that it flips the coin 10 times. And for this particular set of 10, it was four out of 10 that were heads. So this is representing um, 10 people and four of them identify the bottled water correctly. Let's go ahead and change it to a proportion. I'm gonna pick proportion of heads. So four out of 10, that would be 0.4. So that's one possible outcome if people were just guessing. I'm gonna turn off the animation so we can see some more quickly. So another person flipping 10 coins, maybe they got seven out of 10 heads. So we're gonna mark 0.7 on our dot plot. Another four out of 10. This one was five out of 10. Again, five out of 10. So you can see every time I'm adding a new dot to the dot plot, to represent the proportion of heads. Take a second here and think, if I were to keep going, what would this sampling distribution look like? Specifically, what would it look like in terms of shape, center, and spread? So I'm gonna get up to 10,000 here, and now I have a pretty good idea of my sampling distribution. I'm gonna click Summary Statistics, um, and I can see it's pretty much centered at 0.5. That's what we would expect because that's the true long run proportion, right? We're assuming that people are just guessing between bottled water and tap, so we'd expect them to get about half right, but of course we don't expect it to be perfect in one particular set of 10. It could be a little bit higher or a little bit lower, and in fact we see it's even possible for 100% of the group to identify it correctly or for 0% of the group to identify it correctly. There's a lot of sampling variability here, and so you can also see a pretty large standard deviation, or because this is a sampling distribution, we would call that number the standard error. And it has a nice symmetrical distribution since it was centered at 0.5 to begin with. It's not exactly normal though, because it does have big gaps in between the points. All right, so let's draw our sampling distribution here. So the highest value is at 0.5, that's the most likely. And then 0.4 and 0.6 are also pretty likely and it gets less likely as you go down, but it should be pretty much symmetrical. Something like that. So again, this is the sampling distribution, so every dot here is a statistic, and these are the values of p hat that we would get, the values of the sample proportion, if people were actually just guessing, right? In other words, this is showing us the values of p hat that we would get, if the null hypothesis were actually true. So now we can ask ourselves, is this null hypothesis a good explanation for our sample data, right? In our sample, seven out of 10 people identified the bottled water correctly. So if we look here, seven out of 10 does seem to be a pretty common value, right? It happens a good bit, even if people were actually just guessing. And not only that, you can even get values higher than that with people who are just guessing. So basically what I'm doing here is I'm finding our sample data, 0.7, and I'm shading everything to the right. And what that shows me is that values like ours, values of p hat equals 0.7 or greater, those values are fairly common even in this distribution. So they're fairly common even if people were just guessing, right? Remember, that's what we were modeling with that simulation. So even if people were just guessing, getting a sample proportion of 0.7 or greater is not actually very unusual. So in other words, the null hypothesis is a plausible explanation, right? If people were just guessing, then getting data like ours could definitely happen, not an uncommon outcome. So in this case, there's not enough evidence to conclude the alternative, the thing we were trying to prove. Not enough evidence to conclude that people can tell the difference. Basically, we can't rule out the null hypothesis because even if people were just guessing, we might have gotten data like ours.
So I said that values like ours were fairly common, um, but maybe we want to quantify that. We want to use probability to quantify that. So I'm going to put in our sample value, 0 0.7, and I'm going to see how many are as extreme as our sample value. So it turns out that the probability of that happening is about 17% because in these 10,000 repetitions, so 10,000 sets of 10 coin flips, we got 0.7 or greater about 17% of the time. So this number is called the p-value, and we estimated it to be 0 0.1709, and just put a little note here so that you won't forget later um, that this number came from the applet. So it's a little bit frustrating because p-value sounds a lot like p and p-hat, um, and frustratingly they're all different, um, but p-value has a very specific definition. So our p-value definition has three parts. So first of all, the p-value is the probability of getting a sample proportion like ours. So of getting a sample proportion of 0.7 or more extreme. So if you think about how we calculated this, we found our sample value 0.7 and then we counted everything that was further out in the tail. And the reason that we knew to count to the right is because there's a greater than sign in our alternative hypothesis. So we looked at 0.7 or greater. And this is all calculated assuming that the null hypothesis is true, right? In other words, assuming that people are just guessing. And that makes sense based on how the simulation was designed, right? This was all designed just using a coin flip. So because these values are fairly common, even if people were just guessing, we said that the null hypothesis was plausible, right? There was not enough evidence to draw a conclusion. But how small does your p-value need to be before you're willing to reject the null hypothesis and conclude your alternative? For that, we need to set a cutoff, and that cutoff is called a significance level. So the significance level alpha is just used to decide how small your p-value needs to be before you're willing to say that the evidence is convincing. So if your p-value is less than your alpha, that means that it's something that would be very unlikely if the null hypothesis were true, and so you're going to reject the null hypothesis. And if you reject the null hypothesis, that means that you've ruled it out and you have sufficient evidence to conclude the alternative hypothesis. Whereas if your p-value is large, like it was in our example, in that case you don't reject the null hypothesis, or sometimes people say you fail to reject the null hypothesis. Basically in this case, the null hypothesis is still plausible, but so is the alternative, right? You can't really rule anything out. And so in this case you just have insufficient evidence to conclude really anything, um, but you are trying to conclude the alternative, so you have insufficient evidence to conclude the alternative. By the way, we don't say accept the null hypothesis. We're never able to actually prove that the null hypothesis is true. It's just that we don't have enough evidence to rule it out. So we say don't reject the null or fail to reject the null, but we never accept or prove the null. And here I've just written the rule in general that if the p-value is less than alpha, you reject the null. Um, and there's lots of different values for alpha. The most common cutoff, um, the most common value for alpha is alpha equals 0 0.05. Um, but you also sometimes see 0.1 or 0 0.01. Really, you could set your cutoff wherever you want to. And later we'll talk about the reasons that you might pick a high or a low p-value. So this is the basic logic of a hypothesis test. You state your hypotheses and ask yourself what values would occur if the null hypothesis were true. You see if the null hypothesis is a good explanation for your data. If your data would be really unlikely if the null hypothesis were true, um, then that gives you reason to doubt the null hypothesis, right? That gives you evidence to reject it. Whereas if your data would be likely under the null hypothesis, then the null hypothesis is a fairly plausible explanation, and in that case you can't reject the null. So you use your alpha to decide if your p-value is small enough, if it's small enough to draw your conclusion.